Um, I'm Jolie Tingen. I work at Duke. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm here to talk about our efforts around um, the next generation digital learning environments. I know this is a term that's been thrown out. We know most of us have heard this. We've, we've read the EDUCAUSE article, and Duke's been working on this, and it's very much related to how we were thinking about educational technology, learning technologies on our campus. Um, and just to get started with the idea behind NGDLE, um, here are the pillars that um, have been identified under the ELI article, um, the interoperability and integration, something we all, most of us do already, bringing new tools into our learning management system or other tools. Um, personalization is also a concept around NGDLE, analytics, advising, and assessment. Most of us are doing those things, but they're also part of the next generation digital learning environment, collaboration, and accessibility in universal design. So Duke's been thinking about this for a while. Um, this is a, a old a historical artifact for us. Um, it goes back to 2012. That's the year that we implemented Sakai. And we also um, rolled out a tool called Toolkits, which is based on Internet 2's grouper. And it's been connected to Sakai since then, um, as well as other tools in our ecosystem. We also brought in WordPress, multi-user, connected the Toolkits grouper tool, group management tool to Toolkits. Um, to, to WordPress. And so this is th something we've been thinking about and, and, and going for for a long time. How will we bring these tools together and make them work together better? Um, and also sort of this emphasis around the, the group itself, the roster, um, and how to you know, easily connect those tools around the roster. But you see, like even back in 2012, thinking about all the tools that, that we know faculty are using, um, there at the center, you have black, we, we were on Blackboard before we were on Sakai. Um, Duke Capture, which is our lecture capture system. Got WordPress and Sakai. People are already using WordPress. We kind of took that to the next level. Um, and then as you go out in the circle, there's more tools that we support that maybe they're supported more through OIT um, and not through my group, which is Learning Technologies um, and our, in Duke Learning Innovation. and. Um, and then as you get further out with Moodle, SharePoint, Blue Docs, some of these are in some of our different schools, all the tools that people are using, kind of at the different layers. And then on that outside ring are tools that we know people are using that are not part, they're part of our ecosystem, but they're not formally supported by Duke. Um, and you, know, you see Google in that ring as well, and we're not a Google school. So we are always thinking about what kind of needs are, are those tools serving, and you know, how can we you know, what tools in our ecosystem can we uh, leverage to, to meet those needs for faculty. This is a lot. <laughs> so these are a lot of tools. Um, so we've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of this is, is focused around um, local versus cloud as well, like what, what maybe we're hosting in-house and what people are using outside of the university. Sort of related to that, though, is how are people accessing these tools? We have people who are formal Duke people. They have a NetID. Um, when they log in, um, we know who they are. It's all part of our, our single sign-on system, Shibboleth. Um, then we have things that are totally public, um, and they're accessible by anyone, and faculty are using these tools. Um, and then we have the idea of open, accessible by anyone, but does require authentication. Maybe it's OpenID or OAuth. Um, so, you know, these are also different ways to think about our technologies. How, how are people accessing them? How are, you know, how open are they? Um, and, you know, we've had initiatives at Duke that have kind of really pushed us to think about this a lot more, particularly when we moved into the, to doing MOOCs with Coursera. Um, and we're continuing to solve this issue. Um, so my colleague actually generated this diagram as well, um, thinking about how many technologies were in each sphere. Um, and let me just go on to the next slide, because it, this maps the technologies to those different spheres of, of access, the restricted, the open, the public. Um, and you'll see how, you know, what the, there's an interesting overlap here. Um, you know, with where, where Qualtrics and Office 365 live, um, and, and all the things on, under the restricted. Um, so it's interesting to take a look at this and uh, think about 
how that kind of access limits faculty's choices um, and you know um, how many you know how many tools that faculty actually end up becoming comfortable with and uh, how they access those um, so this is a, an article that was inspired by an article that was written recently by the Georgia Institute of, um, of Technology. Uh, they have their own kind of NGDLE par paradigm, and they've sort of mapped it down to these three areas, um, engagement management, learning management, and contact and activity management. Um, we, we kind of think these might be too few, but the idea of kind of keeping these three um, separate to reduce institutional risk um, to, is a powerful argument that resonates both with NGDLE and um, Duke's strategy. So now I'm going to talk about um, what we've actually been doing in practice. Um, so uh, I mentioned a tool earlier that we've been using called Toolkits. It's built on Intertip2's group, um, group management technology. And so it's very focused around the roster. Now, all that sys data comes into the group management tool. And uh, so when they, when they actually go to toolkits, that's what it knows most about is you know, who, who the groups are. Um, and then you, you can add to the group if you need to. It could be that you know, you're starting with your official roster, but you're going to add teaching assistants or librarians or people who are supporting you, technology support. And then you're going to want those groups to have access to all the tools that you're using. So um, you know, these are six that are listed here that we have connected to the sort of next version of toolkits that we have. Um, and previously, toolkits has been kind of more behind the scenes, and we're making it more faculty focused and more faculty facing. And I'm going to just walk you through our work in progress. Um, so we've been working on toolkits. Uh, to our, our new product is called Kits, so it's a variant on what we have. Um, and we've been probably working about 18 months uh, to build this. We did sort of a soft launch in the spring to kind of get some feedback, to refine it, to do a much larger launch in the fall. So we're not running in this in production yet. Um, but we've, we've done a lot of work around it, and we're really happy with our progress. Here are some screenshots. Um, you'll see it has this card structure. It's not an LMS. It does not have a grade book. It, there's really no way to create content with it. It's really more about um, linking out to tools that faculty are using, including Sakai, and sort of this very simplified interface that's focused more on a collection of tools. And of course, the group is connected to all of those tools as well. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how these tools get into the cards in a minute and have the app store that we build. But um, I think you get the idea that it's a very streamlined interface. Um, we know faculty, a certain number of faculty at Duke are not using the LMS at all. They're actually using other tools and you know, we want to meet their needs to be able to quickly access not just faculty but their students as well, all the tools that they're using in a single place kind of like they do in, in, with the LMS, just not so complex. So right now, we're launching our MVP with 10 apps. Um, and then you can see that there's a place on the left that's part of our UI where users can request an app. Uh, a lot of this workflow is inspired by the fact that we know people have tools that they want to use. Um, and they might not know much about tools that are already available to them. Um, and this, we have some good. Um, information for each tool that we're presenting here in the App Store, how to learn more about it, what it can be used for, um, to kind of help with that piece. But also, if there's something that's not here that they want to use, to make it really easy for them to make this request. Um, in, in, in the future iterations, um, we plan to integrate with more enterprise services, highly requested apps, um, as well as the ones that we're piloting. Um, making kits kind of a place that you can go to and really see all the apps that are available to you. So um, if you want to use an app that isn't in the App Store, you'll see at the bottom there there's a, a the custom link option. So let's say you want to use Slack. Slack's not part of our ecosystem, but you can create a, a custom link for your kit that links out to your Slack team. 
and um, you know it allows you to going through that process with a custom link you have a little bit more options as well you can select an icon you can choose who can see it when they're accessing it through your kit um, so it's a quick way for for faculty to get tools in their card and their kit um, outside of our ecosystem and this piece, this App Store piece, is actually um, available to all users to see what we have. Um, we hope to, um, we have this idea that we want to create recipes so that we can actually present um, apps that are often used together and, and what that looks like to give people ideas on, on how they might bring tools together for specific goals. So, um, this is what permissioning looks like in, in kits. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, we have simple, just a few roles, instructor, assistant, student, visitor. And um, it's uh, really easy to give someone the kind of access that you need to your kit. Um, they can create and um, edit, publish, um, all kinds of uh, activities that you would expect people to be able to do. So we've built that piece of kits that was not available really in, in uh, it was available in toolkits, but it looked a little bit different than this because toolkits is very much centered around Sakai because that's our most used tool. So this is thinking a little bit more broadly about permissions and how those map to all of the other apps that faculty are using. So. Another thing that we've uh, talked about, and I, I mentioned this briefly before, about um, that this, is, this specific example is for Sites at Duke, which is WordPress. Um, in terms of the permissioning, that's why it's focused on posts and um, editing and publishing. Um, but in addition to this uh, permissioning area, we have this extra information about um, why we even have Sites at Duke, um, why we chose it, um, you know, some of, the facts, some of the things that we care about, which is openness and things that are standards driven, um, things that are scalable and sustainable. And so we kind of put that out for faculty to see that this is how we think about tools that we bring into our ecosystem. And so, you know, managing people uh, is really at the center um, of, of kits and all of what we're doing. Um, I think that that's. Uh, how everything starts, right, with your course and your roster. That's where everything begins. We're trying to put people sort of at the center of this, uh, with this design around this group management tool. So here's a course. Um, I have permissions to edit the membership of, and um, you can search for someone on your campus. Um, in this case, we're searching for Lauren. And you can give her the role of assistant. And um, once added, Kits automatically provides her with the appropriate permissions across all apps that are used in the course. Um, so again, putting people at the center, making it really easy for all the tools to have access to the same group that you intend to work with for your course is really, really convenient. Um, you can also, we talked about before the open piece and the different levels of access. Um, we know we're going to want to invite people who are outside of Duke, and there's a way to do that through what's called One Link. Um, and that's our, our tool that we have that allows people to come in and, and be a Duke guest, basically. Um, and so that allows people outside of Duke to collaborate with people with their, within their tools and their toolkit. So talking about some takeaways. Um, Culture really matters. At Duke, we don't put any restrictions on what people do with their teaching. I think most people don't at their university. They're able to use whatever apps they want to use. Um, and so we recognize that with that kind of freedom, it creates a lot of complexity and lots of options. And we're trying to deal with um, that complexity and these options with this kind of solution with kits, being able to bring things together, give people information, make it easy for them to make new requests and you know, make it really easy for them to share many tools with their groups, with their roster, and their teaching assistants um, as, as easily as possible, removing those barriers. Um, 
So you know, there's just a lot of choice at Duke. So just remembering what your environment is really like, it's pretty critical to how you design your NGD LA to tools. And you know, we've looked at the data of how faculty are using the LMS. I mentioned this earlier. Um, we know there's a certain number of faculty who are not using it. Some of it's based on just the course itself. Um, it, or it could be around their discipline. So there's you know, such varied use um, of the LMS. And we have some data here about how that breaks down. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting because you know, obviously individual study, we have tons of courses for individual study, and the LMS isn't being used for that. Um, so um, this really inspired how we were thinking about kits and how would we design it. Um, and talking about minimum viable product. I'm sure you've heard that, that phrase before. Um, you know, we have, this has been our philosophy around MVP, um, trying to, uh, you know, really build something useful out of the gate for faculty um, and continue to improve it. And, um, you know, this is just getting user feedback. You know, I think I said we released back in, in January. It was a kind of a small release because we're trying to iterate. We're trying to get that feedback in early, make these iterative improvements, and, and keep improving the tool. So we've, we've actually gotten kits released pretty quickly um, to get that feedback. And you know, just putting people over the technology. Um, you know, we're, my, my colleague put this slide together. <laughs> I was recycling some of my co colleague's slides. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, thinking about what faculty really want to accomplish and making that really easy for them. Um, instead of like focusing so much on the LMS, we do that. We have one. We think it's important, but we know faculty have so many other diverse needs. Um, and so really thinking about that and how we can meet those needs um, is, is critical to how we build this tool. And we know other people are doing this. Um, my colleague has talked more about kits than me. Um, I'm the new product manager for this tool. I think I'm on day two. Um, so <laughs> this is my first big presentation like this. Um, but there have been presentations that you can Google about kits that should come up through EDUCAUSE. Um, and uh, they've been actually been um, in partners with other institutions who are doing things around NGDLE, and this is um, an example of what they're doing at, at Indiana University. Um, so you can, you can learn more about that by, by looking up those EDUCAUSE presentations, because I'm, I'm sure they can speak more thoroughly about it than me. But um, other people are thinking about this, and they're, and they're doing very similar things. Um, so we know that this is... Uh, we're on the right path, and we're all thinking very similar in very similar ways about NGDLE. And that's it for me. Any questions about kids or Duke's approach? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's convenient. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Lucy. And we also have grade scope. Well, it actually comes back to Sakai, but we're, we're grading with the grade scope. I guess I should say that. We're grading with the grade scope, um, and all those grades do come back to Sakai. But yeah. yeah but we, I just wanted to mention we have grade scope since it's you know, a, a grading tool. But. Yes, we actually are using that at NYU as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great for programmatic assessment and I mean, it kind of you know, for a lot of that I totally agree with you on that. Uh, I'd love to see that happen. And in fact, I was just having a conversation with Ian and probably other people that I've talked to about this is that we don't have enough standalone tools to really facilitate more of a model like this with kids. I mean, we have tools that we want to bring in that we know about, but we're, there are gaps. You know, this, this assessment tool that he announced earlier this week, 
I mean, there are assessment tools out there. There's ANS, ExamSoft and DigiExam. I don't know about DigiExam, but I know ExamSoft, because I looked at it a few years ago, is a very complex tool. I would never put it in front of faculty as an option to uh, test and quizzes <laughs> ever. Even the test and quizzes is pretty complicated too, but we just don't have, we don't have good options in terms of standalone tools, and I wish we did. Yeah. We are talking about that with kids because we're doing a lot more um, research with faculty on learning. Um, and they are leveraging what event data they have in Sakai. We need to have better event data in Sakai. Um, but that, that research is already happening, and we want to make sure that we're able to capture that for kids as well. Because um, it's really ramping up. Our, our assessment person is getting more and more <laughs> requests to partner um, because they've removed sort of the barriers of um, well, at least for faculty, they're doing all the work of working with the IRB. So faculty are just like, can we make this happen? And then they do all the work with the IRB to get everything set up. So yeah, sure. Any, anyone else? OK, thank you for coming. If you think of anything later, please find me. Be happy to chat with you about it. Mm-hmm.